So I will go ahead and share the screen that I've got with Acts chapter one on it. And it's in an interesting spot because this is the only book that's almost like an immediate sequel. We have the book of Luke where that's going all the way up to Calvary and the resurrection. And it's written by Luke. And then Acts is the other book that's written by Luke. And it starts right off the bat. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he'd chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So essentially, the first three verses are that brief little synopsis. So for those of you that missed out on the first, here's the last little bit of it. And it's interesting because there are a couple of things that we find only here in Acts because the end of the Gospels, we're covering very specific things, mainly what he just talked about, the proofs such as when he met with them and had them put their finger in the palm of his hand, showing the hole in his side as far as where he'd been pierced. Those proofs were what were covered at the end of the Gospels. You also have um, the two people that he meets and talks with, and they don't recognize him until he sits down and breaks bread with them. It's interesting because those two people, one of them, his name begins with a C and it's skipping out of my brain at this moment, isn't just mentioned in the gospel. He comes up again later in Acts. So this is a person that you actually get a little bit of information about him. And then later on, he's still a Christian. He's still somebody that's being identified outside of the apostles. So this first part is the tie back to the book that Luke has already written or the letter he's already written. And here's the interesting part, because beginning with verse four, it tells the bit that we don't necessarily get from the gospel accounts. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he had said, you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy spirit. Not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, which the father has put in his own authority but you shall receive power from when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The interesting thing about this is we know about Jesus talking to them about sending the comforter, sending the Holy Spirit. The part about stay in Jerusalem we don't have in the gospel accounts. We only have that here in Luke. That's why they were staying there waiting. It was because Jesus had told them, you need to stay here until you receive the Holy Spirit. The other thing that's very interesting about this is what we have in verse eight, where it says, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's the way the word spread. It starts there in Jerusalem. It spreads out locally a bit, but it's not until the persecution hits full bore that you have the um, people spreading out, Philip, not Philip the apostle, but um, Philip, one of the first deacons, uh, he heads up north into Samaria, and he's the one that we have um, first reaching the Samaritans, and then you have the one who 
uh, again, is Philip. I think I might have said that wrong about Samaria. It's Peter. Yeah, no, it is Philip because Philip gives less than full information and Peter goes up there. Um, it's Philip again who gets taken down south and reaches the Ethiopian eunuch who's taking the message south. So right within the book of Acts, we actually see the fulfillment of verse 8 in the order it's listed in verse 8. It's the one of the things that I like to point out about Acts. It's a reality-based book. The reality was when they were told to stay in Jerusalem, what do they do? They stay in Jerusalem until the persecution hits. And when the persecution hits, that's when you see the spread to Samaria. Because were they really wanting to go to the Samaritans? And I think we have to say the answer would be no. They were prejudiced against them. It was a cultural thing. And were they really gung-ho about taking it out into the rest of the world? At that time, I don't believe so. Because what had been the practice throughout the gospel accounts up to this point? It was taking it to the children of Israel. So if they were only going to follow that part of the pattern that they'd been given, they'd have stayed right where they were. And we actually see that happening. So and, we, uh, go ahead. Nothing. It was just the phone. Got on. Okay. okay. So we see right here in the first eight verses, a tie back to the book of luke or in a sense you could even say to all the gospel accounts because it's sort of picking up where they left off the additional information explaining why they were staying in jerusalem and then in verse 8 prophecy that says okay this is the way it's going to spread out and we're going to find out after about four or five chapters why that spread occurs when the persecution becomes so great it would be, uh, what's the word I want to use? Almost like mythology. If what they did is, oh, Jesus had died, let's all go out to the world. If the person is in charge gets killed, how often does everybody that's under them decide, oh, we'll all be leaders and we'll all go out and do the same as the guy that got killed? That's not reality. Reality is the guy that's in charge just got killed. What do we do? Huddle and circle the wagons, protect ourselves. And in a sense, Jesus recognized what was coming. He gave them what they would almost wanted to have heard. When I'm leaving you, stick together. Stay in this spot. You'll be given the extra in due time. And it's after the period in which the, um, oh, rats. I had it in my brain again, what the actual time difference is here. It's not a long time that they're waiting between the time when he ascends. I want to say it's a total of 53 days from the day that he raises from the dead to Pentecost. And that's a date we can actually narrow down because um the time when they were gathering together relative to the crucifixion of christ just before that you had the feast of the unleavened bread and you had um what was it they were celebrating together passover passover thank you so it's the number of days between passover and um, the next holiday that they end up celebrating. And that's why everybody is there in Jerusalem again for Pentecost. And I believe that the number of days for that was 53. So if he was here 40 days, we're talking about only about two weeks after he's ascended. They're not having to wait an extremely long time. And again, I think that's a reality check kind of thing. How long would you hang out if the person who
who had been in charge, the person who had displayed the power and the leadership is no longer there. I think if you waited too long, the people would start to disperse. So any thoughts or questions about the first eight verses that we're looking at? Well, the way I, I see it, didn't whenever Christ was crucified, they all dispersed. They were all afraid of their life. Right. So trying to get them all back together again, you know, after being, you know, going through the garden and the event and Christ being carried off, am I next? Right. So but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be to their best interest to be all together. Right. And we actually only see in scripture, at least, one miracle occurring after the resurrection. And that's when he meets him out by the water and asks him if they've got anything. And he tells him, oh, cast the net on the other side again. And they pull in a bunch of fish and it's like, okay, this is where it all started for a couple of them. And sort of where it was all ending with them as well. That's the one miracle that we see directly performed after the resurrection. So the proof that it's talking about here isn't along the lines of showing more miraculous power. It was showing himself to be real. It was eating food. And that's another fun point. There are two things special about the crucifixion and the resurrection at the crucifixion. When his side was pierced and he bled blood and water, that was proof to the Greeks that he was human. If he had been a god only, then they were expecting something called ichor to come out of his side, something mm -hmm. that's sort of like sap, uh, because gods didn't have blood in them, they had ichor. And so when he had his side pierced when he was on the cross, that showed for the Greeks his humanity. For the Jews that would be witness to his resurrection, it showed both the humanity and the divinity because what do they get to see afterwards? He still has the hole in his side. He still has the hole in his hands and his feet. So the resurrected body was neither human I don't know what you'd call it at that point in time. We don't have a definition for that, but he ate to show he wasn't a ghost. And that's another one of those proof kind of things. He's not this icker based God. And what comes back isn't a ghost. It's real. It's physical. He tells um, Mary and I've forgotten who's with her not to cling to him. And I've forgotten the rest of what he said at that point in time. So they're making physical contact with him. They have the proof that it's really him that's resurrected. They don't have a bunch of miracles going on. But verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be the witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and so forth. So, yes, immediately at the, or just before the crucifixion, they all scatter. The fact that they were willing to come back together, I believe, is a testimony to the truth of what's being said here, that they had received proof that they could be convicted, that we've got a reason to come back together. But it's not something, like I said, that's along the lines of mythology or a Hollywood story where... Well, they came back together. Everybody decided, we're going to take the word of God to the world. Let's go. That's not what happened because that's not where these people are at. The next thing we see happening is, oh, grab the wrong slider there, is the actual ascension, which is covered at the end of some of the gospels. And it says, now when he'd spoken these things while they were watching, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, 
men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. If what had happened is they turned around and poof, he disappeared. That's not him ascending into heaven. Taking the time to say they watched, that he was received up out of their sight, is letting us know with a certainty, this was something witnessed by more than just the 12. There's a large crowd that is there. How large the crowd is, we don't know. We know that the crowd that stays there in Jerusalem, I want to say is a hundred and something. We're going to see that later on in this chapter. So how much of that hundreds there? I don't know. We do know multiple people witnessed this. So the other cool thing about it is Luke's writing transitions, not yet at the beginning of Acts, but later on. When he wrote the book of Luke, he tells us right off the bat, this is based on the witness accounts of others. And I've taken the time to organize it and pull it together. How well did he organize it? The majority of people who will try to harmonize the gospels use Luke as the standard text that they use for the timeline of the activities taking place. And the reason why they do that is because in the case of John, John did not take the time to write out everything in the order it occurred. Fact is, it may not have been John who penned the book of John, because at the very end of the book, it says, and we attest that his words are true. There's a strong likelihood that John never meant to write the gospel account. The congregation, the people that he was with, took the time to record all the things John had been telling them, put it together in an organized letter, and at the end of it said, and we attest that these things are true. It's what was his intention? His intention was to communicate, to convict, and convince. His intention was never to write down an orderly account. Luke's was. The other thing that makes it a little bit confusing for some when they read the gospel accounts is they tend to think, oh, this is all just occurring in the order that it's written. And they're forgetting about the fact that Jesus isn't speaking in just one location. He's trying to get the same information out to multiple locations. He doesn't have the internet. He doesn't have TV, radio, telephone. The way the word got around is he went around and told it. So if he gives the parable of the talents, he I might see. say it one way in one area and say it slightly different in another fact is the talents uh, example is one of the ones where we know it's two different accounts because in one it's going down from 10 on down another one is going from five on down it's the environment that he's at if you've got a bunch of sheep herders you can go a little bit deeper on the shepherding side of things why they understand it and communicating in terms that relate to the shepherds, that makes sense. When you're in the city, yeah, they're aware of it because the shepherds bring the sheep in for the sacrifices. They bring it into the market. They bring it in for these different purposes. How much do they really know about shepherds? They know that they're stinky people because they hang out with sheep and sheep stink. Outside of that, they don't have a ton of knowledge. They've got what little bit they've picked up on. So when talking to the town people, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to bring up some specific examples about what you do when you're shepherding. He just took it on that lighter level of the knowledge that they would have there. That's part of the reason why with the different gospel accounts that we've got, we sometimes see differences in how the message was communicated. Because some of the times we're talking about different audiences that were receiving a similar style message. I can tell you myself, I've only taught 
one sermon more than once. I taught it three times or delivered it three times. And I can guarantee you that the three times I delivered that sermon, <laughs> it wasn't the same because I don't have a written down script that I'm reading from. And we don't have any account of the scripts Jesus was reading from for his sermons. So he was doing spontaneous speaking, working from his knowledge of what it was he was attempting to communicate. Luke is the one guy who's trying to set up an evidence-based situation. That's another reason why I believe it says proved in the first part of this. Because what we're going to see throughout the book of Acts is an account that if you take the time to think about it, like Joe already mentioned, they scattered. They did the panic thing. That's what people do. They're brought back. How long are they sitting together? Not that long before something happens. What do they do immediately? They stay right there in Jerusalem. Because while power has come, right now, they're still a bit in the fear factor mode. We're going to see at various points in time some very human actions, either from the apostles or from the people that they're working with. That's part of the proof Luke is giving us. The other thing that I'd mentioned already, Luke's position transitions throughout the book of Acts. He may not have been there at the beginning of the book, but later on, we're going to find times where he says, we, meaning he was a part of what was taking place. So part of what we're reading in Acts is Luke's account, just like the account he was giving in the book of Luke, when he was giving witness, giving testimony, so that they would have a fuller understanding of what they needed to know about what Christ did while he was here. In the case of the book of Acts, he's showing the beginning of the church. He's showing how it grew and spread. And right there from verse 8, he's showing that it grew in a prophesied way. And we see the fulfillment of of that prophecy throughout the rest of the book. The other thing to remember is just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, while we can sit down and read it in a couple of hours, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each took place over the span of three, three and a half years. Luke is taking place over the span of years. So while we tend to read it and think, oh, well, then they did this, and then they did this, and then they did this. Sometimes it's weeks. Sometimes it's months. Sometimes I spent a full year there. A year has passed. So these are things just to let percolate in the back of your mind while reading through Luke to realize it just wasn't boom, 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 boom. It took place in an environment with no phones, no TV, no internet, no fast communication. For the word to spread, it takes people to spread it. The people that are spreading it initially are afraid. And even when they go out, it's some special people that are making the difference. And initially, it's not the apostles. It was people like Philip, the deacon, and he is going to later on be identified as an evangelist. Uh, that's near the end of the book of Acts. I'm sorry that I rambled there a bit. It's just there's a whole lot of things that take place in Acts that having a little bit of a grounding of realizing <laughs> this is more than just an account of what's going on blow by blow to realize it's being given as a testimony to what's taking place to let people know this was happening in a real world environment that the actions of the apostles themselves and the people that they are interacting with are also very real world responses. And I think I just saw Boone's hand raise. 
Go for it. Uh, Richard, now back to verse nine. And uh, it says, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, some verses says he was lifted up, some says he rose up, some says he was he was lifted up and uh, and received into the clouds. Now, uh, with the version that says he was taken up, does that mean they actually witnessed somebody carrying him up or uh, and some verses say that he, that he just rose up. Um, why would the translation in some of them say he was taken up? It, it was a taken word and infers to me that, that somebody actually witnessed somebody lifting him up. Okay. I, there we go. Doesn't Matthew, one, one of the uh, Gospels, they have an account of this as well too, don't they? The word that's there is a word that means either to lift up, raise up, or raise on high. It can also mean, metaphorically speaking, to be puffed up with pride. It's not so much the method as it is the issue of rising or raising up. So... Unfortunately, one of the things you need to realize when dealing with translations, they're trying to communicate what they think is the thought. Even the ones that are going word for word in their translation are still taking a little bit of liberty with what is there. And it's their interpretation of what was taking place as opposed to just sticking with the literal word. And unfortunately for us, our knowledge of the Greek is slipping and slipping in spite of the fact that they are finding more original and additional time period texts. It's like the word, um, oh, phooey, I was trying to think of an action word because the first word I thought about was snow. In the English, it's snow. In Eskimo, you've got 20 different words for it because it describes each of the different forms, whether it's a light, fluffy kind of snow that can't pack at all. It just sort of acts like dust. It can be a packing snow. It can be the big honk and ice crystal kind of stuff that doesn't even look like snow. It looks more like a snow cone does. They have all these different descriptors because for them, that distinction was important. In the case of the Greek, this is one of those words that the concept is there of rising up. But whether it's a taken up or a lifted up, that's somebody's attempt at trying to make it sound like a story and have flow to it. It's worse in the Old Testament with the Hebrew because there's, their vocabulary is a lot smaller. I want to say the number of different words used in the entire Old Testament is only a third of the number of words that we see in the New Testament. So trying to nail down specific words, sometimes, yeah, you can do it. Sometimes, no, trying to push like the word the. There are people that will make entire sermons out of the word the in a passage. That word isn't there. <laughs> There's an article. It doesn't mean a singular. It doesn't mean the specific. It's just an article before a noun that's telling you whether it's a single, singular, plural, whether it's part of the um, object of the sentence where it's the subject of the sentence, whether it's possessive, it communicates a lot of things. It does not communicate the English A or the English the. The other ugly part to this is back about a hundred years ago, they weren't splitting these kind of hairs. They weren't trying to make a big issue about whether he was taken up or lifted up. They were arguing over the issue purely of, do you need to be baptized or not? Scripture says this, 
do you have to continue to live a Christian life or is once saved, always saved the answer? They weren't going down into the fine itty bitty bits and parsing things. They were working with the big picture. And I'm not trying to put you down or anything. I, I, that's unfortunately the way things have shifted today because the discussion really isn't about scripture nine times out of 10. It's how can I justify doing what I want to do instead of, and oh, well, right here, if it means this here, we're trying to pull answers out of passages where the truth is we can't get that definite about what's there. Robert's moving forward. I think you're going to add something. No, I was just going to say that uh, you're right about this because they, they make so much emphasis now on, on things that are really trivial. It makes, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's just like, that. it doesn't make any difference how he went up, uh, but they go through each one of the gospels and they look at uh, the way that story is told. And because something is mentioned in one that's not mentioned in another one, then they say, this is a, this is an error. And it, it makes no sense at all, because like you've said before, you have different people telling the story and each one has a different point that he's trying to emphasize and a different audience he's writing to. So uh, <laughs> if you go back and read some of your old letters that you wrote uh, to your wife uh, 40 years ago, and you hardly recognize who it was that wrote the letters because uh, your thinking and all of that's changed so much. So uh, same thing is true here. Uh, just, they're just trying to make some way to justify not believing it. And if that's your purpose, then you, you will find what you want that will make you believe that way. The other important thing to remember and when I did the study on Romans, I was emphasizing it almost every chapter. This is not written to be a deep philosophical text. In the case of Romans, he was writing to people who had no knowledge of the Old Testament, no knowledge of the gospel pretty much, just a little bit, enough to be baptized and convicted. But you couldn't give them super deep theological teachings when they're just babes in Christ. But how does Roman get teach today? It gets teach, teach, that was a good word, <laughs> taught <laughs> as this super complicated book. It can't be that complicated if they didn't know the Old Testament. In the case of Acts, he's giving examples of people that are just becoming the church. It's not an established church. They're finding their way through things, and we're going to find out within the first couple of chapters. Humanity is present in the church, and boy, is it ready to mess things over. God pulls an Old Testament maneuver to make sure humanity does not stamp itself on the church right off the bat and lets people know, no, this is my church. It's not going to go down the way anybody wants it to. It's going to get established right. So I understand why there's the confusion because the translations do have differences. Unfortunately, the truth is a lot of what differences exist in the translations really boil down to trying to tell a story. And in this case, he was taken up. How that taken occurred, we don't know. Could have been there was 50,000 angels that came down and took him up. It could have been clouds came underneath of his arms and under his feet, and he rose up on clouds. Could be he just starts going up. How is he getting lifted? He's got to be lifted by something. We don't know. And the truth is, salvation-wise, not critical. Yeah. Uh, verse 10 there 
uh, are the two men in white clothes, are they angels? That's a yes and a maybe. <laughs> the reason why I say yes is because the word for angel in the Greek is messenger. So an angel could be a human who's delivering a message from God. An angel could be an angelic being that strikes terror <laughs> into those who witness it. Because think about what's an angel as far as the spiritual being goes. It's a being that's been in the presence of God. I don't think it was terrifying because it had horns sprouting out of its head and it looked like something you'd find in a horror movie. I think that when you encounter one that has been in the presence of God, that's a terrifying thing only because you realize your position relative to God. Simple example on that one, Moses. After he spoke to God, his face glowed and the people were afraid. Just that one bit of him showing witness that he had been in the presence of God, that little bit was terrifying. When you're talking about an angel that has been in the presence of God, prolonged period, etc., there's a reason why it talks about it being a terrifying experience and people falling at their down onto their knees and bowing down and thinking about worshiping it. Well, yes, my, Rob. my version, my version just uh, starts out that says suddenly two men wearing white clothes were standing beside them. That to me, that means they like appeared. And uh, your version says, behold, but, but mine says suddenly two men wearing right. white, but that's just a version. Yep. But anyway. And again, the word that there is, there is behold, look, hear, lo. Okay. It's somebody making a little bit of more story. Robert? In uh, some of the reports, the uh, descriptions of them, but particularly when they uh, said that the angel was in white and it was like lightning. Yep. And in each instance where an angel appears to someone, it's obvious that uh, they don't mistake it for being uh, just just somebody. They they recognize instantly that they're in a, a the presence of someone that's. Uh, as you said, in the been in the presence of God because uh, all of them, like like Zachariah, he was uh, he couldn't believe what it was happening or what was told, and uh, yeah, of course. Uh, um, and I was just reading about the other day, Mary. What was surprising about her is she's a teenager, but when Gabriel spoke to her, she believed what he told her. Yeah. So uh, he did. She didn't question it. <laughs> she just accepted it. Yeah. Yeah. And when the, the soldiers that were guarding the tomb, uh, it's evident that when they saw the angel, they didn't have any doubt about it not being uh, somebody from around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the other part about what it does say, it does say to men. And the word that is there for the men part, as he pulls it up, is yes male husband etc so that word to me would tend to imply it was people as opposed right. to spiritual beings that they were wearing white apparel yeah that tends to <laughs> run along the theme of dressed in white but that's why I like, ask. yep the other thing to remember and this one's a hard one sometimes for people to deal with. Commentaries can be your friend and commentaries can be a biblical enemy. Most commentaries are written by somebody with a denominational bend who is out to push their view into the scripture. 
the best commentary on God's word is knowing God's word. Mm -hmm. So like the discussion we've just had, what do we know from scripture about angelic beings that are not human? Terrifying. Yeah. Whitening light. I mean, other way around. Lightning white. There we go. Got the right word that time. Um, glowing. Recognizing that they are in the presence of. Whereas this one, behold, two men stood nearby. Gotcha. So. Doesn't change the meaning of anything. I was just curious. Yep. Because my version said suddenly, and that means to me, they yep. weren't there. They suddenly were there. But <laughs> yeah. Well, right yeah. now, if somebody came into my office, one, they'd have had a master key. Two, I've got headphones on. I'm paying attention to this screen. If they tap me on the shoulder, suddenly there's somebody behind me and I'm startled because where was everybody's focus? They were watching while he was ascending. So from their perspective, suddenly okay. there's these other two. I see. So any other thoughts? I'm catching somebody that just moved their arm in the large room, but maybe they were just getting comfortable. <laughs> Okay, let's continue on then. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Can't fit a hundred and something people in an upper room, unless it's a really huge room. This is the group that is staying close together. And it's not just the 11 apostles. It's additional people. We've got Mary, the mother of Jesus his brothers, and the women. Um, the women are the ones that up to this point are probably financing everything that's been going on. They're the ones that are washing laundry, doing whatever they can, financing what Jesus and the apostles have been doing. They're supporting in a very labor intensive way. Uh, and that's not something that should be discounted. It's showing that all along there has been this group. In this particular instance, that group is still with the apostles when they are gathered and waiting. Too often times it's, well, it's the apostles, they're the important ones. No. There was a tight-knit group, the group that traveled with him regularly and supported him. And then there were the followers. And there's that distinction. And I think what we're seeing here is that tight-knit group that's together. Verse 15 and beyond. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. This is one of those things where if you were to read the whole Old Testament, this passage would not have jumped out at you and said, oh, of course, it's talking about Jesus or it's talking about the Messiah being betrayed. The quote is talking about one who has a responsibility and then becomes unworthy. And when he becomes unworthy, it's not just that he gets demoted. Everything gets taken away and given to another. 
They didn't go looking to Judas's brother or other family member or whatever. Everything was taken away almost as though he'd never been in the position. And then that responsibility was par passed on to another. And I use the word responsibility because I believe that's how Peter and the others saw this. They had a duty that when Christ was with them, they were the chosen ones. He chose 12 in their understanding for a purpose. He didn't just go out and say, anybody that wants to. You, 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 you. And he goes through all the yous and there's 12. You are the ones who are going to. We've lost one of those yous. We need to get it back up to 12. We don't ever have Jesus specifying saying there needs to specifically be 12. There are additional reasons as to why 12 would have been used. 12 tribes of Israel. 12 months of the year. You got 12 in a dozen. The numbers are important, not because the number itself is significant, but because when you're talking about an oral tradition, which is what the whole Old Testament had been predominantly, and even into the New Testament, it's not like they start out with Bibles. They're starting out with word of mouth that the earliest letters aren't being written until 20 years after his resurrection. So the knowledge that's getting passed on isn't because they're passing on a copy of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That doesn't exist. At the time of Acts itself, none of that has been written yet. So in that respect, the oral tradition, the communication by somebody passing it on is still really there. So having something that's easy to remember, how many apostles? 12. <laughs> Well, we lost one. What are we going to do? We're going to have 12. That way we don't have to remember the number 11. <laughs> so well, biblically, 12 is considered what they call a complete number. Right. And anything less than 12 is incomplete. Yep. So that's the way I look at the selecting of the additional apostle. Is yep. Because of is to be completeness. And, and if you, go ahead. And and that's if if there's one that's missing, then it's an incomplete group. And for them to function, they need to have a complete group. Yep. When you think about Israel, when they fortified around the tabernacle, it was 12 surrounding the one. The Levites and the tabernacle were at the center. Then you had three tribes on one side, three tribes on another side, three tribes on another side, three tribes on another side. That completeness wasn't just a random number. It was a number they thought about with fortification. It comes up again and again in their culture. So if you want people to remember it, you're going to use the number 12. You're going to use the number probably four, because we've got four seasons. Um, there are various things. You're not going to pick on a number out of left field, 17. I can't think of a time when 17 is used in the Old or New Testament. But when you start to think of 12, you can come up with a couple of different scenarios where, oh, that reminds me of this story, and it reminds me of this story, and it reminds me of this story. That's what's carrying forward here. It makes it more memorable. No, it's fine. I hear a voice in the background. Nope, nothing. Okay. Um, the other thing is important to note there is what it says at verse 17. He was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. They're not without clue. They realize what Jesus had been doing when he was sending them out by twos, when it was the 12, when it was the 70. They were taking God's word 
out into, at that time, the Jews. We've already seen at the beginning of this, it's going to go beyond just the Jews. When we slide down then to verse 18, 18 and 19. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all of his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akaldama, that is field of blood. And if you remember what happens when Judas attempts to take the 30 pieces of silver back, they can't accept it. It's blood money. So they use that blood money to buy a field where they would bury those that they could not bury in a polite cemetery. So the foreigner who can't be buried where the Jews are buried, because you don't do that kind of thing with non-Jews, foreigner got buried in the field of blood. Somebody who disgraced themselves and would not be considered acceptable, again, can't bury him where everybody else is going to be buried. That's where my respectable family members are. You buried them in the field of blood. It's interesting also if you think about it, because what do we remember about the crucifixion? Every Sunday, the blood and the body. So I find it interesting that that comes up here this close to uh, Calvary itself. I don't think it's trying to tie it directly to that. I believe in some respects, this is another one of those things. And what's a word you remember? Blood. <laughs> it's what the life is in. Blood. You don't drink it. And fun part about that, you didn't drink it because where were you going to find the disease? In the animal? A lot of times it was going to be in the blood. Uh, we talk about that nowadays, blood pathogens. So other thoughts about this one before we go ahead and hit on the quote from the Old Testament? Okay, here's the actual quotes from David's writing in Psalm. For it is written in the book of Psalm, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. That's talking about the person who is disgraced, who was dishonorable. Let no one fill that seat of dishonor. The distinction with what comes next, and let another take his office, is talking about duty. Let no one take the place of dishonor, the wrongdoing. However, there is a responsibility that needs to be filled. You're not going to go back to the Old Testament, go reading along and say, oh, obviously, this is a prophecy. The thing we need to realize about the Old Testament, one, it was God's word to the Israelites. Sometimes it was sort of very local specific. Get up, move the tabernacle. Sometimes it was broader in purpose like this. You don't want to be like somebody who has disgraced themselves. You don't want to lift up and glorify someone who has lived that vile a life. I don't care how good the rest of their life is. If they have so disgraced themselves with sin, you don't need to talk about the rest of their life as though the sin didn't exist. Vacate it. Look to somebody who's worth holding up. That's why, like I said, let, their, let that dwelling place be desolate. It also goes hand in hand with the concept of disfellowship. That total separation, that cutting off the one who is remaining in sin. So we have a consistency from what David said and from what Christ says. As far as separate yourself from that kind of behavior. And then you got the other part. Let another take his office, his responsibility. 
that's what they were doing when they filled that 12th position. They were recognizing the responsibility that when Christ picked Judas, like the others, he went out and taught. Like the others, he went out and probably performed miracles. And place on that one to think about, if you start to think, well, Judas couldn't have done it because he was the bad guy. Think about what it says about when he parts the sheep and the goats. The goats are the ones saying, we performed miracles in your name. We taught, we did this, and we did this all in your name. Performed miracles in your name. Just because Judas performed miracles in the name of Jesus doesn't mean he wasn't messed up. What it does mean is that the word of God, and in this case, the name of God, is powerful and effective. Even when it's coming from somebody who's a bit off or way off. If somebody gets out on the street corner and starts spitefully quoting scripture, scripture is still getting heard. Yes, there may be a lot of negative baggage with it, but somebody is potentially hearing and thinking about it and thinking about, wow, that person's a hypocrite, but you know what? What they're saying is true. And again, somebody's raising their hand down there. Are you just stretching and scratching? <laughs> okay. I keep seeing movement in what for me is the bottom picture. And I guess. I was in the swing of your leg. Yeah, I, I see that one now before it was an arm. Okay. <laughs> so part of what we're seeing here is they're looking for what should we be doing now? And where was Peter looking? He was looking into the Old Testament, into God's word. And he found two things that applied. One, nobody needs to be like Judas. Two, we recognize Jesus purposely picked out 12 of us. There is a ministry here that needs to go on. 